called Radiating Black Puerto Rican Feminist Studies from the City University of New York to the Americas and the Caribbean, being coordinated with the marvelous Brooklyn Community Center, Wendy Subway, with support from several institutions across CUNY, the CUNY Graduate Centers, Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative with the Center for the Humanities and the Center for Place, Culture and Politics, also at Brooklyn College, the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities, the Africana Studies Department, the American Studies Program, and the Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Department, and also at City College, the Latin American and Latina Studies Department. My name is Connor Tomas Reed. I welcome all pronouns. I currently teach at Brooklyn College in the City University of New York, and I organize with Free CUNY and Rank and File Action. I wish to thank tonight's panelists, Vani Cannon, Johanna Fernandez, and Carmen Kainard, our interpreters, Aldo Resendiz and Julieta Salgado, the Wendy Subway team, in particular, Rachel Valinsky and Sunny Ayer, and all of you for tuning in tonight for what will no doubt be a transformative event. I invite everyone to share right now in the chat where you're connecting from so we can learn how far and wide we're reaching towards each other. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm reaching out to you from Brooklyn, the homeland of the Lenape and Canarsie people, which is and always has been a place of indigenous movement. Our work today and ongoing at its most fundamental level is in solidarity with the Lenape, Canarsie, and all indigenous peoples here and beyond, whose land was stolen to create settler states and who continue to live under siege, surveillance, and colonial structural violence on their own occupied land. We align with all those advancing indigenous resurgence and decolonization in the face of colonial oppression we support the return of their lands. This acknowledgement is a call to commit and to take on the responsibility to dismantle the ongoing effects of settler colonialism. This is together where we must begin and persist. So I'll now read the presenters bios and then we'll get to hear from them in this order followed by ample time for questions, answers and dialogue with you all. Vani Cannon is an assistant professor of English at Lehman College, where she teaches courses in composition, literature, and creative writing. She co-directs writing across the curriculum, and she serves on the steering committee for women's and gender studies. Vani's research, writing, and organizing draw inspiration from radical transnational women of color feminisms, pedagogies, literacies, and cultural productions. Her work on post 9-11 hate crimes and South Asian cultural politics in the US has appeared in Studies on Asia and Enculturation, an article based on her archival research on the Third World Women's Alliance is forthcoming in Writers, Craft and Context, and an article collaboratively written with two students focused on survivor accountability and anti-racist pedagogy is forthcoming in Radical Teacher. Bonnie's creative writing has appeared in journals including Alba, a journal of short poetry, and Mobius, the journal of social change. Johanna Fernandez is an associate professor of history at Baruch College in CUNY and the author of Young Lords, a Radical History. Dr. Fernandez's Freedom of Information Law or FOIL lawsuit against the NYPD led to the recovery of the lost handshoe files the largest repository of police surveillance records in the country, namely over 1 million surveillance files of New Yorkers compiled by the NYPD between 1954 and 1972, including those of Malcolm X. Johanna is an editor of Writing on the Wall, Selected Prison Writings of Mumia Abu-Jamal, and a writer and producer of the film Justice on Trial, The Case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Her awards include the Fulbright Scholars Grant to the Middle East and North Africa, which took her to Jordan, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship and the Scholars in Residence Program at the Schomburg Center. She directed and co-curated Presente, The Young Lords in New York, which was an exhibition in three New York City museums, cited by the New York Times as one of 2015's top 10 best in art. 
Johanna received a BA in literature and American civilization from Brown University and a PhD in US history from Columbia University. She's the host of A New Day, WBAI's morning show from 7 to 8 a.m., Monday through Thursday at 99.5 FM in New York. And finally, Carmen Kynard is the Lillian Radford Chair in Rhetoric and Composition and Professor of English at Texas Christian University and formerly uh, faculty at the City University of New York. Carmen interrogates race, Black feminisms, Afro-digital African-American cultures and languages, and the politics of schooling with an emphasis on composition and literacy studies. Her award-winning book, Vernacular Insurrections, Race, Black Protest, and the New Century in Composition Literacy Studies makes Black freedom a 21st century literacy movement. Her current projects focus on young Black women in college, Black feminist Afrofuturist imagination, and Afro-digital humanities learning. Carmen traces her research and teaching at her website, Education, Liberation, and Black Radical Traditions. So now I invite Bonnie to get us started. Thank you so much. Um, would you mind sharing the slideshow? <clears throat> so it's really an honor to be here, um, you know, alongside people I really admire. Um, so thank you to Wendy Subway and to Connor for the invitation to participate. Um, I hope some of you were able to make yesterday's June Jordan Life Studies event, which was also part of the series, and I think it's now available on YouTube. Um, for me, it was really moving to think with others about Jordan's approach to teaching, like as a concrete manifestation of her political radicalism. And um, a friend, Depender, who's here actually, um, I'll, I'll embarrass her, messaged me during the event and said it felt like a brain hug, which I felt as well <laughs> during the event. Um, so I want to pick up where we left off yesterday. Um, and um, <clears throat> in this discussion of the Alliance, I want to think through their work as offering a way to theorize about teaching, learning, and the things we create together in classrooms and in political organizing spaces. Um, and before we get started, I also want to shout out Sharon Davenport, who's tuning in from the Bay Area, who actually did the, you know, hundreds of hours of work to process the Alliance's archives. Um, when, when she was a student. So Sharon, it meant a lot to connect with you around this work. And um, I want to think about archiving too, as this really like indispensable labor for the, um, the theory we create out of social movements. Um, so if you could go to the first slide. Um, I think I'll start just by chatting a little bit about uh, what the Alliance was and why it formed. Um, you can change the slide. So the Alliance was a multiracial political organization that maintained active chapters in New York City and the Bay Area during the 1970s, along with a short-lived Seattle chapter. Um, it grew out of SNCC, uh, which had long linked black, free black freedom struggle in the US to anti-colonial liberation struggles around the world. And out of efforts to foreground the particular violence facing black women, including forced sterilization and lack of access to safe abortions, um, SNCC member Francis Beale headed an effort to form a Black Women's Liberation Committee within the group in the late 1960s. Then this group decided to break off from SNCC and focus specifically on the oppression of women and renamed itself the Black Women's Alliance. Um, you could go to the next slide. So this is a, an archived photo of the Alliance. Um, so in 1970, out of a debate around whether to admit members from the Port Puerto Rican Independence Movement and the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, the Black Women's Alliance became the Third World Women's Alliance. Um, you can go to the next slide. And um, quickly um, um, interrupt Tony and yeah. um, bring a, a comment from the interpreter, which is just to, um, from Julieta, just to speak a little bit slower. So we can just sure. Talk. Sorry, this is a life loss. <laughs> no worries. I'll, I'll take a deep breath. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so it's just, this is another set of photos from that moment when, um, when the Alliance expanded to become like a Black and Puerto Rican Alliance. Um, so in an editorial titled, What is the Third World? Um, the, the Alliance outlines its vision of liberation. You can go to the next slide. Um, so they say, the concept of third world unity encompasses the struggles for liberation in the Americas, the Caribbean, and on the continents of Africa and Asia and a commitment to the liberation struggles of African, Asian, and Latin peoples, wherever they may be. We must try to achieve a society which is free from racism and the exploitation of man by his fellow man, 
nation by nation or woman by man. Um, so according to Frances Beale's oral history, the Alliance actively rejected what she called a feminism that posits sexism as the primary source of women's subordination. Instead, they developed an analysis predicated on the interaction of race, class, and gender oppression within an internationalist perspective. Um, so internal documents frequently return to the theme of the simultaneity of struggle, which would later be elaborated on by groups like Combahee River Collective. And um, there were women who disagreed with the formation of the Alliance and chose to remain within their original organization, such as the Young Lords, and struggle against sexism there, um, you know, foreshadowing this long-standing debate around when or whether an autonomous women's organization is necessary in, you know, in, in leftist spaces. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, the Alliance's politics of women's liberation stood in stark contrast to white middle-class feminist organizations in the era. So in her oral history, Frances Beale talks about how in 1970, the Alliance was marching down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan as part of a 50,000 person women's liberation march holding this sign, um, which read hands off Angela Davis and at the, who at the time is being held as a political prisoner. Um, and they were confronted by organizers from the National Organization for Women, or NOW, who said, Angela Davis has nothing to do with women's liberation. Um, and in her oral history, Beale reports that, quote, we essentially responded, it has everything to do with the type of liberation that we're talking about, um, slide. So in a collectively written presentation, the Alliance began to articulate more specifically what they wanted you know, an expansive vision that paired reproductive justice, workplace justice, political education, the full participation of self-identified third world women in anti-imperialist struggles and community control of the basic necessities of living. Um, and you can, you can change the slide. I'm happy to share the PowerPoint for folks who wanna read this later. So Alliance organizer, Linda Burnham talks about this. Oh, you can go back, yeah talks about this work as intersectional in its analysis, regardless of whether they use that term. I think in another interview, she says, we, we did intersectionality before it had to be five syllables. Um, so as she puts it, some of this later came to be called intersectionality, which is a very complicated term, but the ideas behind that were formed in these early years, where people were essentially saying we're whole people and we can't combat women's issues as though we're unaffected by issues of race, as though we're unaffected by the issues that face our broader communities. Um, so the, the, the Alliance was an early, not the only, but an early articulation of this. Um, so there's some important like citational politics here. Um, you, can, you, can, you don't have to shift the slide yet. Um, you know, who do we credit as forming the foundations for third world feminism, for intersectionality, and other theoretical touchstones in radical education today? Um, so to quote an educator named Jennifer Guglielmo, who teaches with the Alliance archives in order to ground intersectionality in social movements, um, she says, which people stand in for the founders of these ideologies and practices? Organizers are always marginalized. And I don't at all mean this as a dig at the thinkers who are typically credited for these ideas, but I think Burnham's words ask us to locate the development of this theory in the everyday, often mundane praxis of building political organizations. So a central part of this praxis for the Alliance was figuring out ways to educate different members of the organization about each other's histories. So M. Jackie Alexander beautifully describes the education that must take place among self-identified third world women in order to facilitate that deep understanding that's necessary to struggle together. Um, so the quote here, in Pedagogies of Crossing, she writes, we are not born women of color, we become women of color. In order to become women of color, we would need to become fluent in each other's histories. We would have to unlearn an impulse that allows mythologies about each other to replace knowing about one another. We would need to cultivate a way of knowing in which we direct our social, cultural, psychic, and spiritually marked attention on each other. So when we think about the Alliance, um, it was a convergence of women of Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous, Arab descent, um, who had organized in a number of struggles, including, but not limited to, um, work against US intervention in Vietnam, the Third World Liberation Strike, housing struggles, solidarity work with women in Cuba, um, the Chicano movement and the United Farm Workers, movements to free Angela Davis and Lolita Lebron, the American Indian movement, 
reproductive justice organizing, um, including you know, forced sterilization and also infant mortality at local hospitals. And in New York City, some of the early members were involved in the, um, the fight for open admissions and third world studies at CUNY. Um, so there is that, you know, that kind of direct connection to these CUNY histories. So in this moment of imagining and attempting to enact third world unity in the US, figuring out methods to put all this work into conversation you know, within the context of a radical internationalism and the material aid that they were engaging in with these women's revolutionary struggles, um, this was a primary goal of the group in their political education and in their cultural work. Um, so to return to where we left off at yesterday's event in the series, you know, with June Jordan's life studies and our collective work to reimagine the center of gravity for educational work, um, I want to turn now to a few of the Alliance's concrete practices of developing this fluency that Alexander is describing, um, unlearning these mythologies and cultivating these ways of knowing. So as many of us know, um, the movement can be a very challenging writing teacher. Uh, I think until I started organizing, I had no idea how to even think about writing a press release or an op-ed facilitating a press conference, developing political education materials, creating engaging banners and chants, creating a website, you know, let alone the deep interpersonal work that goes into all of this. Um, so in Carmen Kennard's book, Vernacular Insurrections, which um, Connor shared earlier, and I think this is a must read for all educators, um, especially those of us teaching at CUNY, she refers to this type of work as protest literacies, um, you know, the kinds of education that students created for themselves outside of formal classrooms during the CUNY student strike. Um, so you can go to the next slide. You know, as Miriam Ching Yun Louie, who's a member of the who was a member of the Alliance's Cultural Committee, puts it, um, I learned to write while writing for the movement. I wrote leaflets, position papers, speeches, funding proposals to get people to do something, understand an issue better or turn out to a picket line. Um, third world revolutionaries viewed culture broadly, expressed not only through a poem or a song, but also through the literacy level of a people, influenced by differential access and exclusion. We tried to take a broad perspective and treat culture as core to how we live and relate to each other and the natural world. And you need things that are going to sustain you for a lifetime of struggle. How can you make a lifelong commitment and live it you need sustenance to feed you and your community. Some will come from the creative arts. Um, so Miriam leaves us with a lot to think about here. And one thing that's been really interesting for me in engaging with the Alliance's history is that their public newspaper, Triple Jeopardy, which we'll see in a moment, and their political education have been documented in a lot of the secondary literature, but their cultural work hasn't as much. Um, and I think that's in part because, you know, most of us weren't there. It's hard to write about a performance, you know, that you weren't um, a part of. Sharon Davenport did go to them and gave me these really beautiful recollections of what it was like to be in those rooms. Um, but I also think it's because cultural work can be more difficult to quantify in some ways. Um, so I want us to kind of think about all three of these spaces, um, you know, new, the newspaper, the political education and the cultural work. Um, in terms of what Miriam is saying about organizing practices that are sustaining and help us make a lifelong commitment to struggle. You can change the slide. Thank you. So Triple Jeopardy um, was launched in 1971 and it incorporated articles, photographs, poetry, interviews, editorials, skills tutorials, and women's health lessons. And it highlighted women's revolutionary organizing in the US and around the world, including in Cuba, China, the Soviet Union, Vietnam, Korea, Sudan, Guinea-Bissau, Albania, Mozambique, and Palestine, um, you know, responding to mainstream media that either didn't report on women's organizing at all, or situated women as helpless victims of war, war, poverty, and political conflict, and not as actors within revolutionary struggle. So according to internal documents, the paper was directed towards an audience of third world working class women and men with a particular interest in readers who were not already active in political organizing. Um, to reach these readers, Francis Beale explained that the paper tried to both affirm the political agency of women of color and to politicize areas of life that were often seen as outside the purview of public political action, um, such as the struggle against machismo and domestic violence, you know, things that are often really play out behind closed doors, trying to make those public and trying to politicize them collectively. 
Um, you can change the slide. So, and like any political organization, the group also engaged in significant internal writing as well. So as part of their political education program, members collectively wrote, edited, and distributed the histories of um, women in the US, focusing on the histories of labor and migration that structured the everyday conditions of life and work. And these various histories were then read alongside theoretical documents to link the different lived experiences to the development of capitalism and the building of US empire. Um, and according to an ar archive document, the goal of this program was, quote, not to create advanced theoreticians or brilliant researchers, but to help, help develop political activists who have the energy, insight, and initiative to commit themselves to a lifetime of struggle. Um, you can shift the slide, thank you. So to think about that, that sustenance and that idea of kind of, you know, generating that, that momentum for a lifetime of struggle around, um, around a group of people, um, the cultural events were really a site where that internal education went public. So um, the, the group began to hold cultural events celebrating the role of third world women in the labor movement. That was sort of how it started. But it was through organizing these events that members de developed a range of skills, which included you know, crafting principles, writing skits that taught history or depicted everyday life, creating outreach materials, organizing visual displays, and um, the, so archived meeting minutes indicate that this ability to communicate intersecting histories across these multiple platforms ended up actually being one of the most effective methods for the group in refining its democratically centralized organizational structure, which is really interesting to me um, to kind of think about, uh, you know, the, the act of planning an, an outreach event as actually, um, you know, having, having benefits for the, the functioning of the organization itself. If you could change the slide. Um, and the shift to, to cultural work came in part because the group was just feeling that they needed to engage people in new ways. Um, these, this, this archive document said, we need to develop organizational forms, new ways of working that will capture the imagination of the people of this country beyond the old rally leaflet forum speech syndrome. So this is where I wanna think a little bit about you know, our, our CUNY context right now. You know, For me, as someone who teaches writing, um, I want to think about what leads us from within these social movement contexts to engage in these creative forms of composition. Um, so an internal memo described these International Women's Day events as, quote, an opportunity to pick up the scattered and diverse threads of our people's thinking and present them in an organized and vital way for historical education and long-term community building. Um, it was a chance for young people to see their parents and caregivers organize to create songs, plays, food, ch and childcare programming that put different struggles into conversation and create a joyous environment for education where people could understand themselves as makers of history. Um, they would say, you know, to, to applaud the performers is to applaud ourselves and also put geographically disparate um, struggle side by side, you know, to quote a monologue from one of the theater performances, we will not melt in your pot, America, nor, de nor decorate your houses with our beads and our culture. My address is at Pine Ridge on Ho Chi Minh Trail. So, you know, in, in the discipline I'm a part of, you know, this, the, the really thinking about the teaching of writing, you know, this kind of creative composition is often fetishized, you know, engaging visuals, audios, um, creating something like a brochure, it's often fetishized and justified via this rhetoric of job preparation for 21st century workplaces, um, especially digital writing. So I think what's important to me as we think about, um, you know, drawing from these histories is regrounding these in these moments where cultural work and composing in different modes took on an urgency and a clear organizing purpose. Um, so I think just I'm going to share one short story and then wrap up with with a few um, a few takeaways for the sake of time. But um, the other day I was talking about this with a, a friend who's also an educator and shared this story about being in graduate classes and being asked to even you know progressive slash radical graduate classes being asked to prepare powerpoints to prepare for academic conferences. You know while at the same time I was part of a group occupying the administration building as part of the media team on the other side of campus and where we had spent days responding to and deconstructing the administration's campus wide emails to delegitimize the movement. And then late one night, this dear friend said, 
let's stop responding to them and just make a photo essay slideshow about all the teach-ins, creativity, and relationship building that's happening in the sit-in. Um, and for me, this is one of the key lessons, you know, to go back to the life studies discussion yesterday, as we think about liberatory education, that we need to understand logics of oppression and deconstruct them, but we also need to be able to shift in small ways out of that logic and into different methods of collective knowing, collective making, and drawing on the knowledges we all bring into movement spaces. Um, so just as the Alliance politicized personal experience through the articles in Triple Jeopardy, um, movements create spaces to politicize skills in new ways and collectivize them. Um, and as a side note, I learned a lot from Joanna's work on the Young Lords around how they did this. Um, so with that, I'll just wrap up. If you could shift the slide. Um, I think in terms of takeaways for thinking about, you know, enacting this history at CUNY today, um, uh, one thing I'm left thinking about is the fact that, oh, you could shift it once more. Sorry, I forgot to. Forgot about this one. Great, and just shift to the next one. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing I'm left thinking about is the fact that students at CUNY and at San Francisco State were demanding third world studies and a third world college, not the atomized area studies departments that we see today. So to return to Jackie Alexander's quote, what would it mean to think about our work as hinging on a pedagogy of becoming fluent in each other's histories and struggles? Um, and second, you know, the Alliance's history helps us reorient global and transnational understandings of feminism back within a radical internationalism, um, especially in light of the institutionalization of women's and gender studies and the fact that we can now have classes in transnational feminism. And there's just sort of more and more uptake means that these things can be further and further divorced from the organizing context that they grew out of. Um, and so, you know, Jennifer Guglielmo, who I quoted earlier, actually has her students, for example, think about pedagogy as material aid. And she has them do archival, she works very closely with political organizations and has them do archival research on organizations like the Alliance, um, you know, for political education training materials for different community organizations. Um, so I think that idea of pedagogy as material aid is really powerful. And last, I think um, there's this idea of highlighting movement exigencies, like these urgent moments where um, movements engaged in creative composition, you know, for students and in our movement spaces. So thinking about how the things we're producing or asking students to produce might more deeply reflect the histories from which we are all collectively oriented. Um, so that's it. I think there's one more slide. Thank you. And I look forward to thinking with all of you during the Q&A. Lonnie, thank you so much. Let's hear a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Johanna. Uh, you're up to, to share about your work. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. I think that part of what we've seen is that there was a robust culture of resistance in the 60s that was also visual. It was literary. It was so complex and rich. And uh, beyond the individual or the collective or the organization, that that culture politicized people when those groups were not there. Um, yeah, it brought those ideas to life, like that visual history that you offer is just, I, I often think that, that we need some of that here in New York City. Um, Oakland has, has that visual political culture uh, that we that we lack. So where do I start? Um, I'll start with the present um, and say that at the height of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk of pre-existing conditions. And um, that conversation was problematic because it suggested perhaps that there was something about race because there was lack of clarity in the media that made the biology of race that doesn't exist, that, that makes black and uh, Latino communities predisposed to, to illness and to death from COVID-19. So that dialogue in the media about pre-existing conditions was tinged with race ideology. 
Uh, and what I thought when uh, I was listening to this was that the young lords who are the Puerto Rican counterpart of the Black Panther Party more accurately um, defined pre-existing medical conditions as diseases of poverty, right? Um, and I don't know if you read an article that uh, was published in the New York Times like on, in July of 1980, after all of the conversation of pre-existing conditions, Black Americans and Latinos are more likely to have diabetes and hypertension, and therefore they're more likely to die. After all of that, there was an article and a, uh, that reported on a study that said that, well, in fact, the hospital that you ended up in had a huge impact on whether you lived or died. And so I think that what was lacking and what it continues to, to, to be lacking in today's uh, conversation around health is, uh, is the class uh, character of uh, health disparities and disease. Um, and I think it's important to know that the, the young lords who said essentially our hospitals are falling apart, we are frontline workers, there's no access to healthy foods in our neighborhoods, uh, we don't get enough wages to, to put decent food on the table, um, the lack of beds in these overcrowded hospitals is what kills us. Um, they got this assessment of, of health and um, its and health crises and its structural roots from, from the Cubans. That's a term that the Cubans used when they were launching a campaign to raise um, the uh, life expectancy of people on the island, literally by putting together um, teams, you might know about this, of doctors and social workers and specialists of all kinds to go into the rural areas, but throughout the island to offer uh, medical care with dignity to people who had previously not, um, not had access to it. And that's exactly what the Young Lords attempted to do in neighborhoods like East Harlem and the Bronx um, in the 1960s. Above all, with others of their generation, they argued that healthcare is a right, a human right, and that um, racism uh, plus healthcare for profit creates a human rights catastrophe. And, and that's, that's kind of the pretty basic thing that, that we need to amplify in this period. And I'm starting there because I was asked um, to to reflect on the young lord's activism as, as it might uh, in, impact what we are thinking about and doing today. More on this issue. So I, uh, the book was published this year uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And interestingly enough, I think I've spoken more to doctors than to any other group. Uh, and I don't think doctors themselves are aware of this because of course doctors undergo this very rigorous training that forces them to be very singularly focused on what's in front of them. So they're probably uh, being radicalized in ways that they don't understand. And I say this because I suggested that in a meeting and people were like, oh really, you think so? Um, and I'm also reminded of the work of Eric Frum, Escape from Freedom, in which, you know, he says that, you know, part of our problem as a, uh, as a species is that we're not especially um, intelligent emotionally to our detriment in our struggle toward freedom, because freedom then becomes this very uh, dangerous and fearful thing that we want, but we, we fear. Uh, in any case, that's, that's a side note. So 
Um, I I've been thinking about this, of why doctors have been um, radicalized, but not just doctors, the entire country around this issue of health. Philosophically, uh, what distinguishes homo sapiens from, from animals, according to anthropologists, in part, is that uh, we engage in abstract thinking and that's that's seen in these mortuary ceremonies that the first Homo sapiens engaged in, or or at least the ones we uh, we discovered that that there is a, a profound um, a profound concern and homage to life in death, and that's what makes us human. One of the things that makes us human. And part of what we saw in our society that's clearly uh, in the process of civilizational destruction and decline is that there was no respect for human life in the middle of a pandemic. And doctors were at the forefront of that macabre uh, algebra that, oh, oh snap, they, when human beings are most human, uh, the state is willing to let it all go to pot and let it all, all go to hell. And that's part of the reason I think that the world sat and looked at this catastrophe, especially us here in New York. Um, we were emotionally radicalized by, uh, by, by this macabre reality. And so were doctors who were at the front lines. And even those who could save us were not, uh, were not protected by the system. So they've been through war and through trauma. And so I am invited to speak to doctors and I'm told 20 or 25 people will show up and 75 people show up. And one time 300 people showed up. Doctors and people who work in hospitals. So that is a site of struggle to be explored um, in this period. And uh, the Young Lords, but also the Black Panthers and the movements of the 60s, ironically, uh, engaged in health activism. And that was fascinating for me to discover while I was writing the book, because when you think of the 60s, you don't necessarily think about health activism. That's not what comes to mind. But, but that's exactly what uh, activism was about in the Northern states, especially um, of the United States during the period. So if you think about the, uh, the campaigns that we know about, the, the breakfast, uh, the children's breakfast programs of the Black Panther Party, there were also ambulance uh, transportation services set up by the Black Panther, sickle cell anemia, education, um, tuberculosis, lead poisoning, um, there was the work of the Medical Civil Rights Committee, a cohort of doctors who are radicalized by the period and make themselves available to the movement and travel to the South to uh, offer aid to, um, to civil rights workers. So the more you look at the period, the more health becomes central to what's going on. The Young Lords also occupied a hospital um, Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, but before the Young Lords occupied that hospital, a year prior, uh, workers in the mental health clinic at Lincoln Hospital occupied the hospital, occupied that, that uh, mental health center because they were procuring a worker community controlled workplace that would truly address uh, the needs of the community uh, and would offer a much more complex understanding of mental health 
that included an analysis of social and economic problems. And that didn't go immediately to psychotropics as was happening in the late 60s. So I don't even have time to tell you how incredible and deep this health activism looks like, but um, this was also the time when 1199 unionized uh, hospital workers, the least paid workers in, um, in the country and definitely in cities like New York um, and on and on and on. Um, so, so that question of why health is one that I was obsessed with. And there are structural reasons for that, that I do not have time to, to get into. But I will say this, as pertains to young lords and their activism. Um, there were two categories of people who were primed for radicalism in the late 60s. Um, and that is the first generation of people of color who were admitted to the university. Puerto Ricans, Black Americans, right here in the city, but also in Chicago, uh, who were alienated in the university, attempted to address the, um, the white supremacist curriculum, uh, and fought for ethnic studies. But some of them left school to organize in the community. But then there was another category of young people of color. And I write this in my book. Um, and that's a category of young people of color who are being influenced by the civil rights and black power movement and the anti-war movement who don't go to college. They graduate from high school, but they are scooped up by programs initiated by the government as part of the war on poverty that sought to address deindustrialization, the fact that jobs were leaving uh, the city in in stages and creating a, a, a crisis of permanent unemployment. That begins in the 60s, really immediately after World War II. And so given that there's this um, up, the swelling of demands for economic justice, there's, there are small programs that are attempt to address the industrialization by creating um, technical training for kids who are not gonna go to, college, but who are going to go straight into the work market, into the workforce. And the hospitals become a place where young, mostly Puerto Rican and Black American young people are trained. They become medical technicians of sorts. And it was that cohort of workers at Lincoln Hospital that joined with the Young Lords. And it was that cohort of workers that the Young Lords sought to organize in in, in what they called the health revolutionary unity movement, which was inspired, whose name is inspired by the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement, uh, a black radical organization of the period that decides to organize at the point of production in the automobile plants in Detroit and beyond. They come to New York literally just to spread the word um, and to raise money and the young lords go to the meeting and they bring the hospital workers that they're working with. And out of that emerges Atrium. So I'm telling you all of this because the young lords are not all that in a bag of chips. They are, but they're, they're part of, of something much bigger that's going on and um, a growing sense that we have to build uh, solidarity and coalitions. Uh, and I reported today uh, on WBAI that that the hospital, um, what is it called? The hospital that's about to close down? Kingsbridge Kings in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Kingsbrook, isn't it Kingsbrook? Kingsbrook. I'm sorry, Kingsbrook, pardon. Yeah, Kingsbrook. So Kingsbrook is about to shut down uh, that during a pandemic that means that people are gonna die. Um, and there's an attempt to consolidate three hospitals in Brooklyn's poorest neighborhoods and 200 beds are expected to be lost as part of this process. This is, this is macabre. This is that same thing again, that we have no respect for life 
in this in 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 this um, society in the middle of, of a pandemic. Uh, and and what was important about the period was that the young lords took over a hospital to amplify the horror of medical care in the Bronx among Black American and Puerto Rican patients, but also to amplify this new thing that was new only because it was more, um, more pervasive and that's medical discrimination because the contact between these uh, public hospital and large medical institutions increased. The contact between these large institutions and people of color increased as a result of the um, expansion of Medicaid. But also the fact that with suburbanization Guess what happens with suburbanization? The fact that white folks are leaving the city to the suburbs en masse. Mom and pop doctors also go. So there's a 33% decrease in, doc in mom and pop doctors in East Harlem who would have seen someone because they were sick uh, and didn't couldn't afford it. Uh, but now that people have Medicaid for the first time, um, and the mom and pop doctors are around, communities of color are using the, begin to use the emergency room as the, the place where they're gonna get basic healthcare. Um, and and, and they, they are confronted with a, a class of doctors who infantilize their predominantly black and brown patients paternalistic, these are people who haven't been reconstructed, right? And so part of what the young lords are targeting and addressing is this medical discrimination, which is broader now because of the increased contact. Um, and of course, part of what I argue in the book is that the young lords, like migrants before them and migrants today as children were the interlocutors between their parents who didn't speak English and these in-hospital bureaucratic institutions. And at a very early age, they gained a sense of the uh, horrible ways in which Puerto Ricans were perceived versus in these institutions by these doctors or the schools versus how the community perceived itself. Um, they, they they got a sense of the notion that they were children of an, a lesser god from these institutions, and and so there was an early organic radicalization that found political and systematic expression because of the the movement of the sixties. It's just fascinating stuff because this issue kept on. I interviewed all of these young lords, and I you know I wanted to know well like what radicalized you. And this issue of being the interlocutors and the translators for their parents kept on coming, coming up in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in New York, um, especially in the hospitals and how humiliating that experience was uh, precisely at the moment when people feel most vulnerable when they're ill, right? Um, okay, so let's look at some photographs. Um, uh, uh, so how, what do I do here? I do hear this. Yeah, there should be a sure. little green yeah. share button. Okay, got it. Um, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, and I want to go to slideshow and I want to start from the beginning. Okay, so the young lords are, they're influenced by the moment, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian liberation movement, but also the Vietnam War. Um, and uh, they, they are inspired by the Black Panther Party. The organization emerges in Chicago as a reformed gang. And part of what I argue in the book is that there were Puerto Rican students here in East Harlem who were looking for um, a, an organizing agenda, but it really took a gang in Chicago to um, make common cause with the most demonized, hated radicals of the period um, 
for us to be talking about the Young Lords today, right? The Puerto Rican students in New York, uh, they didn't think, well, why don't we just get down with the Black Panthers? In part, because we know that uh, migrants don't often associate or want to dissociate from Black Americans for reasons that we don't have time to talk about. Um, so it really took a gang in Chicago of Puerto Rican and Mexican youth who were radicalized by the period and that transformation from gang to political organization was orchestrated by uh, Jose Chacha Jimenez, the, the leader of the gang who was imprisoned and radicalized in prison, not unlike Malcolm X. Um, but when the gang took that bold decision that uh, cut the cord of middle-class respectability, which is also a product of migration sometimes, um, it captured the imagination of young people in New York. And the Young Lords form part of the Rainbow Coalition that we don't have time to get into now. This is a, a Miguel Melendez, one of the founders of the organization here in New York, who was a student at SUNY Old Westbury. Um, so they were self-proclaimed revolutionary nationalists who believed that Puerto Rico needed to be free. That's Felipe Luciano, the, the founder, uh, not the, one of the founders, but the chairman. Um, so Puerto Rican liberation was at the forefront of their, of their uh, efforts, uh, but they were also socialists, self-proclaimed socialists who believed that class was critical to um, the fight for human liberation and that capitalism was the problem. And like Fred Hampton said, that if we don't get rid of capitalism, racism doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of ending. Um, and it was at that moment when uh, these black radicals started talking about the haves and the have nots and joining together uh, with other people across racial lines on the basis of class that all hell broke loose and they became public enemy number one. I'm gonna talk a little slower. Influenced by the Cuban revolution. Uh, this article is important because I've been asked to talk about women and I'm not gonna have much time to do that, but. But at some point, the women just started writing about women's issues in the newspaper and gathering all of the images that they could on women's liberation. And this is one of them. This is the Medical Committee for Civil Rights that I was talking about. And also the ambulance service that we understand today, outfitted as it is, is a product of the Black struggle in Pittsburgh. So before the EMT service emerges as a result of black activism, you call the cops and the cops took you to the hospital. You can imagine how that turned out. So black people, some of them Black Panthers decided, oh, why don't we just transport people to the hospital? At the same time, at around the same time when white doctors were trying to figure out how to provide care outside of the hospital to save people's lives, they got together and outfitted the first EMT truck, fascinating history. Um, so the Young Lords do an enormous amount of work around um, health, issues of health, and they land at Lincoln Hospital. At Lincoln Hospital, they spread to the Bronx because they've been very successful in Manhattan, where in East Harlem. And Lincoln Hospital is known as the butcher shop of the Bronx. It was uh, christened the butcher shop by Jewish immigrants uh, decades prior. They also took over this chest ray x-ray for um, a TB and christened it the Emeterio Betances health truck uh, revolutionary black Puerto Rican doctor. Uh, the hospitals belong to the people. Uh, here they were working with youth against war and fascism. Okay, so this is what they do. And this is what's incredible. So the young lords are important because they were building the movement and a grassroots um, campaign everywhere they went, but they were also building a revolutionary party, something that is not always easy to do. It's a rare thing. So they were trying to do both. We're gonna build a revolutionary party, but we're gonna be grounded in um, the community, in grassroots organizing, and we're gonna build the broader movement of which we are a part, the new left. Um, so they establish a um, complaint table at the hospital, a patient worker complaint table. 
uh, and it operates from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. during the um, during the during the weekdays and all 24 hours during the weekend. And they get 2,000 complaints, which they deliver to the um, to the to the administration. But what's important about this is that they figure out what the hell it is that people are um, not happy about. And these are the complaints. The overwhelming majority of complaints are about unsanitary conditions in the hospital because it was a hot mess. The language barrier for non-English speaking patients, the failure of doctors to explain medical information to their patients and the backlog created by the scarcity of doctors um, and the five to six hour waiting period in the emergency room. A big issue that came up was racism. Do, we, do I have to wrap up? Um, a big issue that came up was racism, the racism of the doctors who infantilized patients and didn't explain anything to them and didn't even look them in the eye. So part of what the Young Lords in collaboration with the doctors, but also because this table was, was, uh, was uh, uh, the people who, who staffed the table were, were, were hospital workers, the technicians, the medical technicians, right? Um, some janitors who were also part of this coalition, they formed the Think Lincoln Committee. Uh, doctors, nurses, everybody and their mother and the young lords, everyone was there. So they were talking and thinking about these issues together. There were problems of racism, but they got talked through and the young lord suggested that the white doctors read France Fanon. Um, so there was political education. <laughs> um, and and there, were, there was an attempt to bridge the community and the workplace. So their demands included um, better wages for doc for 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 hospital for the least paid workers in in the uh, hospital one hundred and forty dollar a week minimum wage for all workers no cutbacks because this is also the moment when um, when uh, neoliberalism emerges this is the beginning of the budget cuts so the budget cuts are coming down and uh, they're going to cut beds and doctors in an already alien. A, ailing environment. Uh, but this is what I wanted to say. So because they're so intravenously connected to the grassroots and talking to the community and to workers, they realize with the doctors and the doctors come up with this, they come up with this together that let's address this issue of racism and discrimination or the fact that, you know, we're unreconstructed, but we need to get better at this by um, calling our patients by their last names and greeting them upon entry into the medical office or the room. Hello, Mr. Uh, Ramirez. How are you? <laughs> and what can I do for you today? Something basic as that is the product of a very grounded uh, campaign. Uh, they occupy the hospital. This is all over the New York Times. The mayor sends folks um, from his administration to wrest the hospital from them. Uh, okay, uh, this they find these things, these um, sterling rock salt bags in the hospital when they take it over and they decide to use them to block all the doors so that the cops don't come after them. They had a whole thing planned out about what they were gonna do with the cops. This is in the hospital, um, Pablo Guzman and Felipe Luciano. One thing about the Young Lords is that they're, um, among Puerto Ricans, the, the black Puerto Ricans join the group. Socialism at Lincoln is their objective and they want to turn the hospital into a project that is not just in one building, but that is in the community and has clinics everywhere and sends out teams of doctors and other specialists to the neighborhood to prevent disease. Um, okay, I'll end here because I probably have to end. Um, so what ends up happening is that um, Carmen Rodriguez dies when she gets an abortion at Lincoln Hospital in 1970. New York had um, legalized abortion before Roe v. Wade, the state. The doctors were residents, were residents in training um, who performed the abortion, didn't talk to her, Again, they didn't say, hey, how are you? Can you tell me how you're doing, how you're feeling? Do you have any pre-existing conditions? She was a longstanding uh, 
patient there and she had a record, but they didn't consult the record and she died because she had a, a heart disease and um, they performed a saline abortion, which is deadly for someone with a heart condition. So this is just two weeks after they've taken over the hospital and they again get together the community, the doctors and everyone and their mother, they force the, the, the hospital to, uh, to host a medical conference with the community, the first ever known of its kind that allows the community to cross-examine the doctors about what happened to Carmen Rodriguez. They want they want justice for Car Carmen Rodriguez, but they don't want this to ever happen again. So they end up drafting the first known patient bill of rights as a result of this very grounded. Uh, and you, you, here are the demands to choose the doctor you want to have and to have the same doctor treat you all the time. The continuity clinic, I don't know if you guys know anything about public hospitals, but public hospitals um, allow medical schools to train their students with black and brown people patients who are less likely to complain. Um, all of these issues began during this period because of the affiliation system that I don't have time to get into. It was a semi-privatization of the public hospitals wherein the private medical schools were asked to staff the, the hospitals because there was a shortage of hospitals because a lot of uh, doctors, sorry, doctors, because the, the doc, many doctors left to the suburbs. Um, so, uh, so they established essentially a container around this crazy relationship. Okay. If you're going to use us as guinea pigs, we need to, we need to, they need to be well trained and supervised, but there also has to be a continuity clinic. We can't see a revolving door of doctors all the time because it's terrible for our health. So the continuity clinic, which is something that all medical students recognize today, as an important thing is a product of the struggle at Lincoln Hospital with the young lords and the doctors. Um, so much more to say. Um, the visual culture is absolutely incredible, as you can see. Um, uh, this is their newspaper, Palante. Uh, again, political education tool. And I'll just end by saying that uh, hospitals are like the third or fourth or fifth largest, a big employer in the country. Um, and we saw that, uh, and of uh, important space, we saw that, we saw that the, the nurses and other hospital people were at the forefront of a fight back against um, policy around the pandemic. There is a profound um, campaign ready to be born in the hospitals because of the radicalization of the last period. Um, but also because as I said before, health is this thing that brings us closer to our common humanity. And it gives us a sense that uh, we need to fight for uh, when you're, we're living in the United States that we, can't, we have to fight for a system that, that prioritizes life and ours doesn't because it's organized around profit. I'll end it there. Johanna, oh, thank you so much powerful presentation and so many connections um, and lessons for our own present moment. Um, without any uh, further delay, Carmen, you have the floor. Thank you. Good, good evening, everyone. Greetings. Um, thank you to my co-panelists for your inspiring work and all the, ins all the inspiration you've provided us here. Um, this evening. So, um, and I also want to thank Connor, especially for everything, always, um, for your friendship, for your companionship, all of this, and Wendy Subway for um, organizing all this, bringing us together to connect these things. Um, so I, I'll just say here, I am going to, I'm going to put this in the chat. So I am going to be so reading from a few stories here. I have a tendency to talk too fast, so I am hoping this keeps me in check we can just hope. Um, so I'm going to try to sort of um, slow that down. But what I've also done, what that is, is a link, a short link to a web page. And that is basically what I'm going to be talking from here. So if that helps, if people need that, um, that kind of accessibility to what, what I'm talking about to my words here, hopefully that will help a bit. Um, and also, like I said, I will try to, to 
to slow this down. And if there are any kind of questions or anything else um, later, I can add the links and things like that to that web page so that, you know, build on it, it, I will build on it later, so it'll be open that way. So I want, I'll start here by saying that I come to you from Fort Worth, Texas today. So I wanna start by acknowledging that the land on which I am currently living is the territory of the Wichita and affiliated tribes. So I am among those whose lived reality sit at the intersection of what I call intertwined abominations, kidnapped from one land and forced to labor on stolen land. So stolen labor on stolen land. I'm also starting this way because I want to begin by reaching towards more than what we're seeing a lot of, which is these kind of performative statements or this cut and paste slogans that you can put at the beginning of a syllabus or a conference or a presentation. We see many of our colleagues doing this, especially right now, where you give a land acknowledgement and then pretty much right after you can just move right into styles and policies that are framed from white settler colonization. Um, so if it's part of the work of my own land acknowledgement, I want to always situate myself, especially as a descendant of enslaved Africans on stolen lands, as central to the very purpose and spirit of the kind of alternative classrooms that I think we can build. I, I want to also say here that when I say classrooms, I don't mean something as owned by schooling, particularly uh, under imperialism in the United States and the global north. Um, so as we can see from the presentations, classrooms have happened everywhere um, and probably more powerful classrooms. So I identify as a Black feminist educator, agitator, and dreamer. I'll just say here that these three categories are fluid and cross-pollinating for me. Um, I, I also should apologize here. I just make up words. So um, yeah, just go on and make them up with me. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to make up some words. So I should, anyway, so, but I don't know of a single word that can capture that kind of cross-pollinated being. So I have to be a little clunky here and specify black feminist educator, black feminist agitator, black feminist dreamer, because you can't be any one of these things without the other. And classrooms that are committed to radical literacies and radical spaces must require above all some really radical imagination. Um, so for me, education and literacy are always part of my plot particularly in classrooms. And I mean plot here in the sense of the provision ground. So I'm gonna go back to slavery a bit to until our afterlife of slavery. And I'm talking about the provision ground as framed by scholars like Sylvia Winter, Judith Carney, and Catherine McKittrick. So I'm referring here very specifically to the plot of land that was oftentimes set aside on slave plantations for enslaved Africans, where slaves, especially women, kept alive food wave traditions from Africa. So they got these little plots of land um, that they could work with. So give trade and seeds and things like this. But what's big things are happening in these plots, these small plots, where they're, like I said, keeping alive these food traditions from Africa. They're working through alternative relationships with land and earth than what you see from the people who call themselves the slaves masters. And they are literally tilling into the United States. Um, new possibilities that are deliberately in connection with their African past and who they had been. So these provision grounds, these plots, um, categorize new kind of dreamscapes and they are literally praxis. So for me, um, and this kind of relates to work that we see around fugitivity, maroonage and things like this. But for me, fem black feminist classrooms are a provision ground. It's a narrative. It's a real space in time and it's a praxis. Um, it never loses sight of the plantation that has stolen you, but it also never loses sight of alternative conceptions of your humanness that you are in fact always caring for us despite multiply oppressive regimes that are denying you. So the plot is like its own literate act. So I wanna move into telling some stories now about myself as a teacher in CUNY. Yes, I am in Texas now. If you were wondering if it's different from Brooklyn and CUNY, yes, it is, we're very different. Um, so I am in Texas. Now, this is only my second year of um, strangeness. So, but I wanna talk about myself as a teacher in CUNY, which is where I started teaching at the college level and which is where I, um, where I left recently. And I'm hoping that this, these stories are gonna flesh out the past, present and futures of black feminist classrooms as a very different history, a very different plot. So I, I find, 
I'm infuriated by this finding, but I find that there's always an assumption that black feminist praxis is more welcomed or at home in a space like CUNY because it has such a large black and brown student population, um, especially black and brown women students, which is then nested with an assumption that the faculty mirror the demographics of the students. Um, not true. The faculty of CUNY has been as white as any other place where I have worked, if not whiter in times, and in a city that still has the largest black and brown population in the United States. So there's some serious structural issues at CUNY. Um, and to assume that black and brown feminists have an easier time at CUNY is profoundly anti-political. It lets institutional regimes of white resistance and white solidarity completely off the hook. It erases the work of black feminist teachers at CUNY and it erases the activism like what we have seen earlier. That is what create, created the provision ground of CUNY as a black and brown space. So like I said, CUNY as a functioning system is as white as anywhere else. And really, I don't, you know, I don't understand why people don't get this, but any basic knowledge of colonization and oppression should tell us that any plantation or imperialist economy um, that does not mirror and reward a large number of black bodies with black liberation. That's just not the history under colonization. So I don't understand why people get confused by this. Um, so whiteness is never an accident. It's not merely unfortunate, it's deliberately created. So despite the fact that CUNY is by and large, it is a brown and black college space, justice teaching, decolonized education, multimodal curriculum design, critical literacies, culturally sustaining education are as elusive as anywhere else and you have to fight for it. Um, in fact, it has often seemed to me that critical pedagogical possibilities have been even more choked out given in, because and, and I'm I'm always get in trouble for this, um, of my resistance to these kind of institutional insistence everywhere that these types of students, and that's the language that I've given constantly, need a back to basics, grammar-based instructional mode focused on a close reading of the white classics alongside technical job placement. Um, and this history of what we've seen and these young people suggests, makes that actually ludicrous. Um, and in terms of pedagogy and higher education, you really just can't get any wider than that kind of sentiment. But black feminists at CUNY have not forgotten these aspects of the plantation economy of schooling, not even when CUNY insists that it has done otherwise, is doing otherwise. And that lies the radiating power. I'm sort of drawing from, the, um, from the, the title of our session tonight. So here's this very specific story I, I wanna share today. So this is about two years ago, not quite two years ago now. I was on this college-wide curriculum committee, which meant amongst other things that we vetted all the new courses for the college. Um, so this gave me, I guess a good part of this was it gave me access to course content in the, at the college that I really otherwise did not have. So you get these, just these syllabi and these um, course proposals from everywhere. Um, like most committees, this one involved incredibly tedious bureaucratic processes that meant long ass meetings that have, could have been handled in more interesting and less time consuming ways, all for the purpose of what I call bourgeois pageantry of importance. Um, you know, like what I think are very typical public displays of white plantation life. Um, so you had to sit through that for <laughs> a long time. So one course that we were examined, examining was designed to look closely at the emergency response systems of local and state municipalities in relation to human services. So EMT, fire, um, all, uh, uh, and this course was a hot mess. Um, so the content flowed from the professor's own textbook that students were required to purchase and represented issues related to the nation state, terrorism, counterterrorism, how that got in there, I don't know, but it was in there, um, and municipal services, but it did it in a way that used this kind of textbook speak to mirror the most conservative white nationalist ethos of our time. Um, it was stunning. And the instructional model took the form of a kind of vocationalism um, that mostly quizzed students on the lecture content that matched this textbook. So the conversation on the committee never really interrogated the content because the content on this kind of committee and, and really all the places where I work, content is regarded as faculty expertise, as academic freedom. So you don't touch that, you don't question that. Um, so almost all of the committee's discussion was centered on pedagogy. 
So determined to just get in where I fit in, I laid out what I thought was an undeniable fact. And I said it multiple times that basically this was an upper division course geared for college juniors and seniors with a curriculum that looked almost exactly like that of the 1980s vocational high schools that had dotted my own childhood in Ohio. So I'm gonna rewind that back for you real quick. So this was an upper division college class at CUNY that looked like a 1980s vocational high school course that, that was specifically designed for racist segregation in the Midwest. And you should know here that all of those high schools that I'm talking about have since been closed and they're no longer in operation. So I said as much and I kept saying it. Uh, it was not popular, but I kept saying it. And the highest ranking administrator in that setting agreed with me. But she then explained to me that this course was a big improvement from the way that things have been. Um, yep, she said it, an improvement. She must have seen the look on my face because then she started breaking it down more for me. And according to her previously at the college, students just attended lectures. They took quizzes on the lectures um, with content that was even more offensive and then submit a paper at the end of the course. And for most of them, students wrote one major paper in their first semesters of college and used that one same paper for all of their classes for the entire duration of their college years. That was just how things used to be. And so the argument went like this. This new course presented on this bureaucratic ass committee that echoed 1980s Ohio curriculum for racially segregated vocationalism was a huge improvement. So I wanna just reiterate here that these were the words of a high ranking administrator who passed the class through these bureaucratic process, processes and it has since been promoted at the college. Meanwhile, this history of racially segregated curricular vocationalism was used quite literally as the measure against which we see progress in the education of black and brown New York City youth at this particular CUNY campus. So again, I'm not talking about a long time ago. This is less than two years ago. So now, though this example might seem to border on absurdity, because it was certainly absurd for me, I assure you that this thinking is quite typical in many ways. Um, and for the purpose of our time together today, I want to just state the obvious here and note that this kind of racially segregated curricular vocationalism has never been a Black feminist education at CUNY. Um, but I want to dig a little deeper than just that. So if, if this scenario that the administrator gave is the litmus test against which all advancement gets measured, then really anything with a pulse could count as change and improvement. Uh, and that's just not a coincidence. Um, so I want us to see the ways that universities make a pernicious investment in a white racist linear progress narrative that will tell you that things for you are better and parade in the absolute absurd if and whenever it needs to make its claim of progress against you. Um, it does this consistently and it does this perniciously. And if you fall prey to it, you can be assured that no radical transformation will be coming will be forthcoming for you or from you. So these kinds of points of origins, these kinds of starting points of reference and these points of comparison for me do seriously violent white supremacist work in the educational lives of black and brown youth unless we map out different points. So what I'm saying here then is that CUNY's black feminist classrooms, its history of black feminist organizing, of black feminist educators, black feminist activisms are a point of origins that let you map out and move towards different spaces in time. Um, so I think CUNY offers us real space and time where black and brown college students compose black and brown lives with black and, with black and brown feminist teachers. Um, Women like Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and Tony K. Bambara are, and I have linked on the webs on that web page to um, the work that people like Connor have have, have done um, in Lost and Found with these particular activists and educators. So just like that. CUNY white administrator who described to me her frame of reference for classrooms, we also have our own frames. After all, Audre Lorde, and here's the irony, Audre Lorde talked at this very college where I had this conversation. So clearly the white administrator's historical narrative is not the whole or entire paradigm or entire history at that campus because um, her version is not what Audre Lorde students were composing in their classes. So. What, what, I'm, what I'm really interested in when I think about 
classrooms, when I think about teaching, when I think about the activism that we've listened to, that we've heard about, is as I want to ask, I want to constantly ask myself and ask us a question, the question of, so, so what if the Black feminist classrooms of Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and Tony K. Bambara were our point of reference today in the curriculum meetings of our minds and spirits? What if they're the reference point? Um, what if we framed and narrated such Black feminists as the origins of 21st century classrooms in and out of CUNY, in and out of the, the traditional classroom? And what if they were so much our point of comparison, it's that comparison itself had to even just dissolve away since after all, I think we'd be hard pressed to write a narrative that we have, that we've progressed and improved on the education of black and brown youth um, that unless we're just going to consider a white supremacist narrative. So what if these black feminists were so close to us in our teaching and with us in our classrooms that they become us and we become them? So th these are the kind of questions that I want to leave us with. Um, these are the things that for me, black feminist literacies and black feminist classrooms compel us to remember all the time and in all the ways about the work that has always been happening in the plots on the provision ground. So I'm gonna bring that back to the provision ground and say that what um, these histories that we have, these histories that we're looking at has given us new plots, um, new ways to narrate and new ways to do things. So that is, that's it, that's my time. I will, I will close with that and then we can open up to some discussion. Right on, Carmen, thank you so much. That was so powerful and I am deeply grateful that uh, everyone uh, tuning in, that you were here to witness all of this brilliance that has been brimming uh, in each and across these presentations. And um, this is, we have plenty of time for questions, for conversation, comments, um, just to share a couple of things, I'm thinking across the three presentations. Um, the, the work of uh, becoming, the work of, um, as Vani had uh, quoted M. Jackie Alexander, we became women of color, the question of um, becoming uh, radical CUNY educators and educators in our communities relating to Black and Puerto Rican and third world feminist struggles, thinking about fluency in each other's histories, um, thinking about pedagogy as material aid to movements, also thinking about this question of the radical development of Black and Puerto Rican and third world youth that uh, Johanna had shared uh, some of this history about these two tracks of youth going into CUNY schools through struggles to uh, um, desegregate CUNY admissions, but also these different kinds of technical training or social aid programs that brought them into hospitals. So thinking about hospitals as a site of struggle and health activism. And then Carmen sharing questions about um, uh, on the flip side of this, this kind of banking model, vocational schooling that persists today can produce a kind of labor segregation inside the classroom and a kind of white racist linear progress that's actually against uh, Black and Indigenous and Latinx and Caribbean and uh, Arab and Middle Eastern and Pacific Islander students, um, that these are the stakes of our conversation. So um, I wanted to uh, offer a couple of those uh, links in, in the constellation of what people talked about tonight. And really, this is now the time to hear from uh, people in the audience. So if uh, folks would like to jump on the mic to be able to share uh, a thought or to share a question, then feel free to put your name in the chat as I just uh, modeled, or you can put some questions in the chat as well and then I can read them as we go. So, but this is a, a time for, for collaboration. So I, I look forward to, to hearing from folks what's coming up for you. And feel free to take a moment. I'm seeing Yolande sharing, really loving this reframing of the lands through Black feminist pedagogy and classrooms as cultivating new plots of soil to cultivate new colonized minds, selves and ways of knowing. And I see you, Amadou, would you like to share some thoughts? Yes, I wanted to ask, you know, about uh, the Lord's 
uh, activist uh, group that was operating during the 60s. Are they still, is that group still in existence or it has uh, disappeared and maybe be replaced by even more vibrant uh, activist groups? Mm -hmm. And maybe we could get to hear a couple of questions. So there's one question about whether the Young Lords are still in existence or any relationship to current activist groups. And I want to invite if anyone else has questions or comments, feel free to share them in the chat or feel free to jump on the mic to, to be able to reflect together. Please go ahead, Sunny. Yeah, speaking um, or thinking about um, the Young Lords at Lincoln Hospital, I just wanted to know historically, I mean, I'm gonna read your book, Joanna, but um, I was just wondering how they left Lincoln Hospital, like how that kind of occupation ended or um, I don't know, was, was stopped or that kind of intervention. That's a great question. Uh, the start of uh, direct actions and also the ending of them. And I'm also seeing uh, Dr. Maria Perez y Gonzalez from Brooklyn College's uh, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Department. Can Vani and perhaps Johanna elaborate on the part of the Third World Women's Alliance that Puerto Ricans and the Young Lords opted out or were being considered? So maybe we can take a couple questions together. Johanna or Vani, would you want to share some, some thoughts and response? Go ahead, Vani. I, I was going to say if you wanted to start because of that first question that was specifically on the Lords, and then I can, I'm happy to jump in after you. Oh, so the first question is that the Young Lords uh, are not active today as a group. Uh, like the Black Panthers, it was an organization of the period that was eviscerated by um, COINTELPRO, um, so those organizations stopped existing, at least the Young Lords, by about 1974-75. So on that question of like the moment when the Alliance forms and, um, you know, the, the, the different feelings around the formation of the Alliance, I think, um, you know, it's really this kind of foundational question of, um, you know, what, I mean, there's several foundational questions, but I guess one of them is kind of what is, what, what do we choose as our sites for um, the struggle for gender liberation? And so is, is it within a political party? Is it really trying to build, um, build, um, build among women in a more autonomous space? Like, do you understand your, do you understand your work is really wanting to focus um, on issues that have been historically marginalized within these larger, um, larger political formations. And also I think this question of um, really who do you want to build with and where and how are you trying to build? I know that the, so the Alliance was critiqued for example by James Foreman from SNCC for being an educational organization more than an, or, within an organizing um, organization. And I think um, in their responses to that they tried to break down this binary of education and organizing and see political education as kind of imbued in all of our, all of our work. But if you do, look at them, um, you know, I think there was kind of much more of an emphasis on that kind of educational work rather than direct actions like a hospital occupation. And that's real. So I think um, thinking through those differences, also thinking through um, the, you know, what one other criticism kind of early on in the formation of the Alliance is that it really situated sexuality as a lifestyle and not as an axis of oppression. Um, and in the, the sort of second formation of the Alliance, which was called the Alliance Against Women's Oppression that op operated in the eighties and kind of shifted towards solidarity work and political education around um, liberation struggles in Southern Africa. Um, you know, they kind of, you know, to quote one of the organizers got their shit together around sexuality and kind of, you, you know, developed a deeper intersectional analysis that 
um, saw sexuality, you know, as, as an axis of oppression as well. So um, I think there's, you know, there was a group of folks who decided they really, they wanted to stay and fight in SNCC. And there's a long history of, of women writing position papers and taking positions of leadership in SNCC. Um, decided they wanted to stay and do work in the Young Lords or in the Puerto Rican Socialist Party around, you know, pushing things like infant mortality. Um, sorry, I, yeah, sorry, I, I will take a deep breath and slow down. Um, <laughs> decided they wanted to stay and do work around things like um, infant mortality and forced sterilization, um, safe abortions and access to birth control in those organizations. Um, and I think something that, um, that, uh, a comrade of mine has been talking to me about also is thinking through the class dynamics of um, kind of who stays in the alliance versus thinking about, for example, the formation of the Lords in Chicago, really coming out of, you know, coming out of gang life and thinking through, you know, as we're choosing, you know, you know, where and how to put our organizing labor, how can that fall along class lines too? Um, because um, I think these things can often replicate themselves. So I'll pause there. I don't know if, um, Carmen, you want to jump in on any of the questions? Y'all got it. <laughs> I'm seeing uh, uh, Ya also share some thoughts. Um, this is a great transformation that Young Lords and the Third World Women's Alliance groups have created to eradicate the mindset of racism that existed before. Indeed, we were not women of color, according to the Women's Alliance group, and that is why it was impressive to know each other as their culture so that they could be able to accomplish their purpose of eradicating feminism. Uh, thanks also to the young lords for valuing life and fighting and bringing up ideas as to how, how deaths can be reduced and preventing medical discrimination. Um, Eve also has a question uh, with gratitude to Carmen for your talk. I was wondering if you could talk more about how you're thinking through the provision grounds and black and indigenous labor and life on and in the land growing otherwise plot lines for living, if you may want to reflect on that. Yeah, um, I would just say here that you're sort of in um, multiple directions as, as someone residing in the academy um, right now, or, so, or someone teaching at, in higher education right now, and sort of, just always having to resituate myself in terms of what and and not value what the university values. And that sounds really simple, but very few people really do it. I see um, a lot of people talking about um, fugitivity and marronage in the academy, and yet every single committee, every single neoliberalist idea that the university creates, you're just jumping right on board. It's like, instead of running away, you're running right into it. Um, I think that in terms of, especially right now, in terms of the spaces that, in terms of the sort of official classroom spaces that students have access to and how are we redirecting what happens um, in like in Zoom spaces for, for young people, for particularly for graduate students um, who pre-pandemic were really um, organizing and strategizing against universities and um, universities using this moment to quell some of that. And so how do, how do we regenerate that energy here in this space versus, um, I mean, it, it's, some, it's, it's been amazing to, to, to watch just how, just how deadly some of the Zoom meetings I have to go to during the week. I mean, all that toxicity of the university just gets placed right in here. It's just like, without missing a beat or taking a breath, it's just right back here. Um, and what it means to intervene there and build something different. Um, we're st you know, you're still in it, but it doesn't mean you have to be um, of it. So it's constantly sort of going back and forth between who are you in this space, in this moment, in this university, um, in this sort of post-slavery university, um, and who are you with students and what are you doing? What are you doing in building together? Um, and so in building around this, this, this Zoom the Zoom moment. So I think those are sort of very large, that's very general. Um, and then nuts and bolts in the classrooms. I do, I still think that in classrooms you can do some things, but uh, it means you have to undo everything else um, it, or not do it like all of the other spaces. So um, I'll say that in a kind of general nutshell there. Mm -hmm. 
I'm seeing a question from Toivo uh, for Johanna. What is the legacy of the young lords who decided to return to Puerto Rico and to continue their struggles in that context? And I would just add a, a question for people who are tuning in tonight from the Caribbean and from Latin America, um, how can these struggles around uh, uh, black liberation movements, Puerto Rican liberation, third world liberation in the United States um, be able to have a, a more hemispheric character in thinking about colonial schooling, thinking about uh, the role of social movements across the hemisphere? Um, another question to throw into the mix. Um, I, I wanted to ask, answer the question, how did the, uh, how did the occupation end? But in thinking about Carmen's remarks, uh, I, I'm on sabbatical. So I, I have not had to deal with, with teaching on Zoom, oh my God. But, but what I think Zoom has done is that it has broadened access to the university beyond, uh, beyond the brick and mortar. So, I mean, I'm giving talks to like high school students and a lot of 501c3s in the Bronx who uh, bring in the community. So it's, I mean, I think that, uh, that Zoom is, is creating a culture of learning beyond the university that's robust that we don't yet understand with all of its problems. Um, and interestingly enough, I think what ends up happening with this expansion of education is that the university itself retains its old structures and doesn't want to let them go, which is what I imagine is going on. But, but some other revolution happens that ultimately is going to call into question the university. I imagine um, the, it, the the university seems seems kind of behind a few behind the times uh, in terms of its relationship to the world. Anyway, I just thought I was thinking about that when you were speaking, Carmen. Um, how did the uh, how did the occupation end? Um, first of all, the young lords occupied the hospital again with others in November. In fact, November 11th or 10th, I think, is the anniversary this year of the uh, 1970 occupation second that ended up producing the first um, drug treatment center to use acupuncture uh, in the treatment of those with um, drug dependency. And that's, it was revolutionary then, and it was almost criminalized, but now it's the practice across the world. Um, the, uh, there were millions of, of uh, it was a complex struggle. Uh, some conservative doctors went out on strike in protest of the, the activism. And uh, whereas in the past, there hadn't been any police activity in the hospital now. What it led to was an increase in, in, in police activity uh, in the hospital that circumscribed activism. And the same thing happened in the schools. So it's in 1969 that police are introduced into the schools in New York precisely at the moment when there's all this activism. And it was liberals who presided over that policy. <clears throat> um, and there's much more to be said, um, but what they left behind was this, uh, uh, this culture of struggle that they added to, and also this patient bill of rights, which was so, so important and we take for granted today. And um, translation, the idea that you need by law to be offered a translator when you see a doctor. Um, the work in Puerto Rico was difficult. It's the subject of my last chapter. It's complex. The young lords turned to Puerto Rico prematurely without um, even speaking, many of them speaking the language. And uh, I'm convinced that that 
premature move to Puerto Rico was influenced by COINTELPRO. And ultimately the, the move to Puerto Rico um, stretched the organization beyond its capacity and led to more um, repression and the ultimate decline of the organization. Uh, in Puerto Rico, the young lords encountered an enormous amount of class prejudice, race and class prejudice on the part of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. Uh, and the Puerto Rican Socialist Party had a, a predominantly middle-class character and they were disproportionately white. The young lords were like kids from the Bronx and they were a, an, a, a mainland formation. And, um, and that, that difference between organizing in relationship to the black freedom movement here and a different kind of organizing uh, in Puerto Rico that in terms of the Puerto Rican uh, independence movement at that moment was dominated by middle-class white Puerto Ricans that, that just created a clash of epic proportion that was captured in the newspaper of the period in Puerto Rico. And, and all of that is outlined in the last chapter of my book. Um, it wasn't easy. And they tried to recreate in Puerto Rico the campaigns that they launched in New York and that just doesn't work. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, thinking about another connection between Puerto Rico and the CUNY system, while uh, Black and Puerto Rican students were talking about desegregating and decolonizing the CUNY system, also challenging the existence of the Reserve Officers Training Corps in Puerto Rico at the University of Puerto Rico uh, campuses. There were these massive protests against the ROTC and um, Puerto Rican student struggles were seeing their work as in alignment with the Vietnamese, including communications with the Vietnamese uh, student uh, liberation unions. So uh, very much lessons to learn from Puerto Rico as well as hearing um, these, uh, this icy reception of the Puerto Rican left when the young lords arrived. Um, and I'm seeing uh, a question from uh, Violeta. Uh, greetings from Rutgers, a question for Vani. Um, this aspect of collective testimonial writing in Latino and African-American anthologies like this bridge called My Back, um, how they have conformed a revolutionary language that educators and writers can appropriate and transmit how can we organize collective writing practices in classrooms and coalitions between writers to build anthologies like the ones in the 60s, where women did not feel isolated because of these intersectional collectivities where they all shared their structural oppressions? And what new genres and writing practices, forms of coalition building are available now for writers and educators? And Eve is also asking about the question of how humiliation can become a transformative space of activism um, in, for, with regard to young lords and their interactions with doctors. Um, so perhaps a last couple of thoughts from each of the presenters before we wrap up um, at 8 p.m. Thanks so much, um, Violetta, for that question. Um, I think I'm, I'm thinking right now about how, um, you know, when I encountered this bridge, it was in that context of kind of institutionalized gender studies that I was talking about earlier, where it wasn't until I went to a panel with some of the um, some of the writers from this bridge that I got a deeper sense of the context out of which it emerged. Um, you know, thinking about the fact that for years before that anthology came out, women, the women in print movement, I mean, people were forming collectives, forming publishers, moving into collective houses, writing feminist children's literature, writing queer literature that they were then like sneaking into university mail systems because it was still illegal to, to, um, to uh, send anything over state lines in the US that, that could be read as queer. I mean, this was still in, in the Comstock, Comstock laws. And so thinking about that context, thinking about the fact that many of the women were political organizers, thinking about the context that, um, you know, a few people have gotten institutional positions or become paid organizers and, and been able to um, kind of sustain a life. I, re I remember 
Sheree Moraga saying on a panel, look, a lot of the women in that anthology, you know, didn't live very long. <laughs> like there's, you know, to Joanna's point, there were health issues, there's environmental racism, there's the stress. Um, and so for me, that context was so crucial for understanding this bridge and its, and its power, but then the risk of that power and context being stripped from it and kind of how it's taught now and how it inhabits institutions now. Um, and so when I think about that, you know, I think anthologies are still, I mean, anthologies are still, you know, obviously people are doing really powerful anthologies. Um, but I, when I think about um, this question of how we, how we might do this work now, I don't know, in a creative writing class I teach, we always do a class anthology at the end, but it sort of left me with this question about how, you know, where is that work, that coalitional thinking and work happening now? Um, for better or worse, I think it is in digital spaces and on social media. I think there's limitations to this. I think there's affordances to this. Um, uh, but I also think um, that maybe asking some of those questions in digital spaces is, is important. I'd be curious to hear from other people here. And it also makes me think about audience and kind of who deserves to hear and to read these stories and how that's also, you know, I think that a lot of that story sharing can happen in um, interior spaces, but it doesn't. And I think there was something re really revolutionary about this bridge making that public. But I think that work happens a lot in ways that aren't necessarily made public. Um, so that's how that's how I'd end it. I would love to sit and talk with people about how they could see, you know, some sort of you know collective publication functioning now. I think it would, you know, in an era where there is more digital publication and where some of these radical anthologies have been kind of institutionalized, I think that there's, it's, it's a really dynamic conversation. Thank you welcoming, so much. Thank you. I'm welcoming Carmen and Johanna, if you have any final reflections for us. So uh, in thinking about Vani's uh, comments and uh, some earlier questions, I think that the the Third World Women's Alliance uh, the, and Black feminists, um, first of all, they engaged others in conversation, like the Young Lords. Um, in many ways, they raised the level of political discussion around these issues that were not being talked about, and they did it precisely at the moment when there was um, a shift in the movement, the beginning of a shift from the streets. There was a decline in the mass character of the movement. So I think uh, that was very important work. And it was uh, strategically um, important to use the, um, the theoretical and political advances of the period at the end of the period to consolidate its lessons around black feminism something that hadn't really been talked about thoroughly or theorized, right? So, so that was important work. That was activist work. It wasn't in the streets. In fact, this was a moment when people were in, leaving the United States in search of um, greener pastures abroad, like the Young Lords, but also the Black Panthers, because reaction was, was here, was upon us. Um, so you could argue that, that whether they knew it or not, the black feminists were, were responding to something and consolidating knowledge that we have today. Now the young lords wrote about all of these issues, the women in the newspaper, and they had their news, uh, a, 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 um, a newsletter called, uh, called, I forgot, I, I had it there. Um, I forgot what it was called now because my I'm drawing a blank. But they had a newsletter and, and I am sure I'm, that the existence of these other women's groups uh, enriched their work um, on issues of women in the community. Another important thing about women's issues within the organization is and health is that the young lords would not have been able to go to do, go to door to door without women members of the organization, because who's going to open up the door to a bunch of guys in fatigues, right? So, 
So the expansion of women's membership in the organization, in fact, also deepened its health work. Um, and then there was an, a last question. What was the last question? Oh, humiliation. There, I'm, there have been a number of questions, humiliation. Um, I'll, yes, you know, I think that 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 the sixties are important for all kinds of different reasons. One of which is that within the left, it asks the question for people of color, for women, who am I? And what's my relationship to society? But also how is oppression and exploitation manifested in my life? And how, uh, and how is growth political growth for the new society, um, part of the work that I have to do internally to decolonize uh, myself. So that's a personal question, right? Um, that, that forces us to acknowledge or come to terms with vulnerability, humiliation, because of patriarchy, sexism, racism, um, and the ways in which class uh, exploitation and oppression is manifested in the rela our relationships, for example, between the doctors and the young lords and the paternalism, both because of racism and class that might have been uh, at work there. I'll just say one thing. So I think humiliation, yeah, the humiliation that young people, children experienced as interlocutors for their parents was had a radicalizing effect and and as adults i think the young lords wanted to redeem uh, the super exploited class of workers in new york city puerto ricans who were their parents right the factory workers the least of these the people that the new york times and other newspapers talked about as bad hombres literally but also mild-mannered people um, so I'll just say one thing, um, to end, which is one of my favorite moments in the history of the organization. A lot of young lords in, in, uh, in Philadelphia, in Chicago and New York talk about how their names were mangled by their teachers, their Spanish names, and, and they didn't have the courage to stand up and say no. That's not, that's not who I am. If they were called John when their name was Jose. And during the, um, during the church occupation, they were arrested en masse and their names were mangled in the courtroom and they got up and they properly pronounced their names. It's a very emotional assertion of your humanity by demanding that people pronounce your name properly. Once humiliation, now a site of defiance and self-determination um, and resistance. Thank you for that. Carmen, do you have any final reflections? I'll just, I'll be brief here because I'm just, um, based on the conversation, just thinking about, thinking back to this bridge caught my back, the text, the anthology, this bridge caught my back. And it just made me remember, um, I've used that text a, a, a lot in, in my in my CUNY classrooms and my undergraduate classrooms, particularly classes. Um, and I want to I want, I want to say my gender studies classes, which are largely students who self-identify as queer and or feminist and or folk of color. Um, that the way that that text resonates so much for them um, and particularly in it usually do some kind of um, um, a kind of classroom mural where we take all the different pieces of it and we re re-inscribe the walls but what has always been interesting to me is the, the actual the words of the poem this bridge called my back the, the Kate Russian poem um, and so I'll just read the last two quick stanzas here and, and think about why why so these young people at CUNY who I'm talking about 
um, gravitate to these words so much in light of everything we said. So that those last two stanzas are, the bridge I must be is the bridge to my own power. I must translate my own fears, mediate my own weaknesses. I must be the bridge to nowhere but my true self, and then I will be useful. So I'll close with, with that, with those words. Thank you, Carmen. Everyone out there, let's give another round of applause to Vani, Johanna, to Carmen, Ashe. I also want to give gratitude to Julieta and Aldo for interpretation, to Sunny and Rachel with the Wendy Subway crew. Um, so um, a couple of events that are coming up as part of this residency on November 20th, reading Audre Lorde in community with the Audre Lorde Reading Group. Also on November 30th, translating Audre Lorde Now with friends who will be tuning in from Cuba, from Mexico, also from Germany. Um, also want to encourage everyone to stay connected with Wendy Subway on social media and at wendysubway.com where you can find out more info about this residency, including a featured readings list for future studies. And if you wish to share this event recording or to view yesterday's event about June Jordan, then you can go to Wendy Subway's YouTube channel as well. But for now, I encourage everyone to take care and to stay healthy and to continue this learning and liberation work out there. So thank you all so much and tremendous respect. Good night, everyone. Thank you.